All right, our next question is from Jesse on protein toxicity and the carnivore diet. Rob, in Wired to Eat, you briefly mentioned on page 27 that humans cannot consume more than 35% of their calories from protein before suffering from protein toxicity. The carnivore diet has recently gotten some publicity and seems to have some anecdotal success for folks with stubborn autoimmunity issues. Do you think following a carnivorous diet carries a high risk of suffering from protein toxicity? And would we be able to look for evidence of protein toxicity in kidney function testing? So I'll answer the last one first. Uh, it, it, the protein toxicity is not a kidney issue. It's a liver issue. It's, it's uh, you need substrates other than protein to deal with the ammonia and nitrogen-based byproducts of protein metabolism. And in general, humans seem to hit about 35, maybe some populations as high as 40% of their total calories can come from protein. And then beyond that, uh, uh, we have rabbit starvation. You were reading a book that was talking about trout, trout starvation, starvation yeah. which I had never heard of. Linking on the book, but yeah. But a, a similar deal where people were eating a, a, a exceptionally lean mm -hmm. proteins and ultimately ending up with problems because mm -hmm. they had no other, no other substrates in there. It would be hard as hell to do this because the experience of protein toxicity is very uncomfortable and the main desire that you have is to eat something other than protein. Mm -hmm. The only reason why people get into these scenarios is that they literally have no other yeah, options or, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and isn't it because those types of things like rabbits and trout are very, very lean? lean. Proteins. Yeah, yeah, and and so even if you were to eat something like rabbit or trout, that's why you eat the brains and the innards, and you know you're trying to just mm -hmm. you know get every little bit of fat out of them and and uh, and whatnot. And so um, I'm I'm a fan of the carnivore diet. I don't think it's the the first place for everybody to to start, but man, the results that people are getting in this kind of autoimmune seen are really impressive and so I, I i'm optimistic about where this will go i would actually not be surprised at all if some iteration of a carnivore intervention ends up proving to be more efficacious than autoimmune paleo and i'm the person who came up with the term autoimmune paleo i'm the first person to write about it publish it in a book and and really coined the term so i'm, I'm you know as much as aip has helped people I would not be surprised if um, carnivore ends up benefiting more people when it's all said and done for a whole host of reasons. But uh, someone would just need to be in very difficult situation to induce a state of protein toxicity. Well, because most people on the carnivore diet are eating like ribeyes and they have lots of fat and, that, and other cuts of yes. meat that, that yeah. there's a significant amount of fat in yeah. there. Yeah, okay. and or they're adding some additional fat to it and stuff like okay. that. So yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. So because of that, they're not they're not hitting. This. They're, they're when you do kind of a breakdown, usually people are right at like thirty to thirty five percent of of calories from protein. Yeah, and this is one of the interesting things, like uh, the the Inuit, um, some of their gene alterations, uh, like they don't really generally enter ketosis. Um, they seem to more directly mobilize fatty acids, but. It's it's an interesting adaptation, even though the Inuit are held up as as a uh, an example of like a ketogenic culture. Biology decided that it was more efficacious, more survival advantage to create uh, these gene alterations. That um, there's actually a very high infant mortality rate from low blood sugar. It, 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 you know. Uh, uh, in, in that very early period right after birth, which most babies are in ketosis, but different Arctic-based uh, uh, populations may not even be able to enter that. But the two adaptations that they seem to be better at, their protein threshold may be as high as like 40 to 45%. So there may be a couple of percentage points higher on the uh, ability to handle protein. And then also in lieu of producing ketone bodies, they're better at direct mobilization of fatty acids for energy. So it's an interesting adaptation. And in uh, uh, even Lauren Cordain's early work kind of suggested that human, the, the, maybe the default mode for humans is kind of bumping up against that protein threshold consistently. And uh, it, it's just because there's all kinds of, you know, mythology around this stuff. And yes, humans ancestrally were big game hunters and bigger game 
was fatter, but there's kind of a reality that, like, I've actually lived as a hunter-gatherer for a period of time, you know, and it's like... Eight days. Starved. Ten fucking days. Fucking calories are hard to come by, you know, and um, and you eat kind of whatever you can get your, your hands on, and... Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to I belabor that too much. I picking you up from the airport, and you did not look like my husband. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> you I was were so skinny. skinny. Yeah. It was only like 10 days since I dropped you off, and you were like emaciated. 20 pounds lighter, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 